Alright, we're back and we're finally going to learn our first quantum algorithm. But let's make a few formalizations of what we've seen so far in the first two videos. If you haven't seen them yet, I highly recommend that you go watch them first. I mentioned linear algebra in part 2, and that was no coincidence. Since the state of n qubits can be fully described using a list of 2 to the n amplitudes, we can think about such states as 2 to the n dimensional vectors of amplitudes on each of the basic states, which, by the way, are actually called the basis states in standard jargon, because they form a basis for 2 to the n dimensional space. Each basis state can be thought of as existing one unit away from the origin on one of 2 to the n orthogonal axes. The sum of the squares of the amplitudes must equal 1, so geometrically, that means that the state of the qubits can be represented with a single point on the 2 to the n dimensional unit sphere. But did you notice the problem? In this geometric interpretation, for any number of qubits more than 1, we already need at least 4 dimensional space, which is more than we can visualize. Jeffrey Hinton has some nice advice about this. To deal with a 14 dimensional space, visualize a 3D space and say 14 to yourself very loudly. Everyone does it. Well, in this case it's 8, but you get the point. While we still can though, let's go back to just one qubit and see how things look with just two dimensions. The way to describe quantum instructions operating on qubits is to multiply the state vector by a matrix of transition amplitudes. To see what I mean, recall the amplitude tree definition for Hadamard. Let's see how we turn it into a matrix. Suppose we have a qubit in the basis state 0, represented by the vector that points to 1, 0. Now we can see the geometric result of applying Hadamard. And here's what would happen if we started in the basis state 1. If you remember from last time, the property of valid quantum instructions we learned was that if the sum of the squares of the amplitudes for the input state to a quantum instruction is 1, then the sum of the squares of the amplitudes for the output state is also 1. Now we have a nice way of reformulating that statement for vectors. If the input state is a unit vector, then the output state is also a unit vector. This property is actually exactly describing what is known as a unitary matrix. So every quantum instruction on n qubits corresponds to a 2 to the n by 2 to the n unitary matrix and vice versa. To get a better feel for how these matrices work, let's look at the matrix for toggle. This operation corresponds to a reflection about the 45 degree axis. The instruction rotate from last time is named for a reason, which is that it rotates the state vector. Unfortunately, to express even just a 2 qubit system geometrically in this way, we already need 4 spatial dimensions. So instead, let's remember Jeffrey Hinton's advice while we go about things more algebraically. Suppose we have two qubits A and B, and we want to do Hadamard A. Since we are applying Hadamard to A, we can use the normal definition for Hadamard to fill in transition amplitudes for basis state pairs where B doesn't change. Again, since we're only applying Hadamard to A, the transition amplitudes between basis states where B changes are zero. We can create the matrix for Hadamard B using the same process. If we wanted to do Hadamard A followed by Hadamard B, then we would multiply these two matrices by each other. The order of multiplication actually doesn't matter here, even though it usually does for matrix multiplication. Intuitively though, this should make sense, since Hadamard A and Hadamard B are both one qubit operations acting on different qubits. So the order of the composition of the two shouldn't matter. Let's give this new matrix the name H all of 2, since it represents doing Hadamard on all qubits in a two qubit system. We're going to be working with these matrices for a while, so for simplicity, now would be a good time to notice that the thing we really care about is the sign of each of the entries of the matrix. The actual values all have equal magnitude, which is just some power of 1 over square root 2. 
So let's use a shorthand and replace positive entries with a plus symbol and negative entries with a minus symbol. From this point forward, we can pretend that all pluses are equal to each other and all minuses are equal to each other. I promise the math all still works out. There are just some hidden constants being swept under the rug. Notice that with this new notation, h all of 2 can be broken up into 4 blocks, where each smaller block is a Hadamard matrix for 1 qubit. This recursive pattern actually follows in general, meaning that the matrix representing Hadamard all on n qubits looks like 4 block matrices in terms of Hadamard all for n minus 1 qubits. We're going to skip the proof of that in this video, but you could do it by induction. If any of you are able to do it, I'd love to see what you come up with in the comments. It's finally time to return to Mystery Toggles, which if you remember back from part 1, contains some subset of the lines if x1 then toggle answer, if x2 then toggle answer, etc. In part 1, there were 3 x's, but here we'll consider the more general case where there are n x's. We want to know which version is the true Mystery Toggles with as few calls to Mystery Toggles as possible. With the classical approach, we saw in part 1 that an optimal strategy solves this problem with n calls for n x's. However, if mystery toggles can operate on qubits, it is possible to use just one single call no matter how many x's there are. And here's the code that does it. Let's do an example where n equals 2, and suppose that the version of mystery toggles we are dealing with is the one that includes just the line for x2. First, we create three new qubits, x1, x2, and answer, which induces this state vector where all of the amplitude is on the state 0, 0, 0. We then toggle answer, which is a bit weird because the answer qubit is where we've been collecting our results from mystery toggles, but bear with me here. The corresponding change in the state vector is that all of the amplitude gets transferred from the state 0, 0, 0 to the state 0, 0, 1. The third step is to do Hadamard all, now because all of the amplitude is in the fifth entry of the state vector, if you know some linear algebra, you may be familiar with the idea that the matrix multiplication of h all of 3 with our state vector essentially selects the fifth column of h all of 3, and the result of the matrix multiplication is this uniform superposition where there is an equal amplitude on all possible input states except the ones where answer is 1 have negative amplitudes. Next is a single call to mystery toggles, which in each basis state toggles answer if and only if x2 is 1. There's something really neat that happens here because of the fact that previous to this step, all states where answer is 1 had negative amplitudes, and all states where answer is 0 had positive amplitudes. The consequence of this is that when we call mystery toggles, the basis states where answer doesn't get toggled still have a positive amplitude if answer is 0 and a negative amplitude if answer is 1, just like in the previous state vector. But the basis states where answer gets toggled now have a negative amplitude if answer is 0 and a positive amplitude if answer is 1. The state vector now encodes a sort of truth table for mystery toggles. In particular, Positive amplitudes correspond to mystery toggles outputting 0, and negative amplitudes correspond to mystery toggles outputting 1. Taking the basis state 0, 1, 0 as an example, the fact that it has a negative amplitude indicates that if x1 is 0 and x2 is 1 and answer is 0, answer will be 1 after mystery toggles is called. And for this other state 1, 0, 0, its positive amplitude tells us that if x1 is 1, x2 is 0 and answer is 0, then answer will be 0 after mystery toggles is called. This is really encouraging since we seem to have all of the information we need encoded in the amplitudes. But the problem is that if we were to measure our qubits now, the fact that all of these amplitudes have the same magnitude means there's an equal probability of each possible measurement, so we would actually get garbage information out, a uniformly random 3-bit binary string. The missing piece to the puzzle is another Hadamard all, and this time the purpose of this instruction is completely different from how we used it a moment ago. Watch what happens with the matrix multiplication.
It turns out that the amplitude gets cancelled on all but one of the basis states, which precisely encodes the version of mystery toggles that was used. So when we measure all of the qubits, we learn what that version is with probability 1. This kind of seems like magic, and in some sense, it is. In fact, the best explanation I can give you as to where this comes from is that the sequence of instructions we've been calling Mystery Toggles Detective was actually discovered first, and the Mystery Toggles problem was invented as a problem which this algorithm solves. It goes without saying that most of the time we have problems that need to be solved, but in this case, we had a solution that needed to be problemed. This discovery is thanks to the work of Ethan Bernstein and Umesh Vazirani in the late 20th century. I've been keeping it a secret for educational purposes, but in truth, Mystery Toggles and Mystery Toggles Detective are actually called the bernstein vazirani problem and algorithm, respectively. What you're witnessing here is a particular case where quantum computation is very powerful, Quantum superposition allows us to, in some sense, simultaneously compute a function on all exponentially many possible inputs of a given size with only one call to the function. But that's not even the crucial part of this algorithm. In fact, we could do the same process to get a state vector that encodes the truth table of any Boolean function. But remember, measuring such a truth table state yields garbage output. What's special here is that for this particular problem, we're able to make an algorithm that manipulates the resulting amplitudes of this truth table state in a way that produces a meaningful measurement. We're not quite done here. We still haven't proven that this algorithm is correct, and I was able to come up with what I think is a pretty neat original proof. Not to say that nobody has done this before, but I haven't found it anywhere. To prove that Mystery Toggle's detective works for any particular number of x's is simply a matter of simulating the code in all possible cases for Mystery Toggle's and verifying that it works. But in general, if n is not fixed, we need something a bit more clever. I made the decision to defer this to a separate video though, so stay tuned, and I'll see you soon.